Okay, so here we are for one of our uh, weekly seminar. And uh, today we have the pleasure to have uh, Athanasia with us. So Athanasia uh, uh, studied physics at the University of, uh, of Athens and um, she completed her study in 2020. Then she moved to Marseille in France at the Laboratoire d'Astrophysique for uh, her PhD studies. And uh, she completed uh, the PhD in last November with a thesis uh, titled Intensity Mapping from 2D to 3D, Evaluating the Feasibility of Interpreting and Planning Data. And then finally, uh, January, the last January, uh, she moved here in Crete uh, for the, fir the first, uh, her first postdoctoral appointment. Uh, joining the, the Titan uh, project, which is a collaborative project uh, between the Institute of Computer Science and the Institute of Astrophysics here. So thanks for giving us this talk today. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, how much time do I have? <laughs> I didn't see the information. So mm, something like 15 minutes with question. Okay, I think we'll do more than enough. Okay, uh, hello everyone. I'm Athanasia. Uh, so today I will show you part of the work I did during my uh, PhD, uh, work that focused on uh, intensity mapping, uh, either 2D or 3D, as a means of studying uh, galaxy evolution. Um, so first, a brief introduction so I can place my work in the big picture and give you the motivation behind it. Um, so a slide that most of the people they start their talks with, here we see uh, the a simplification of the cosmic history as we know it, starting from the CMB after the recombination, <clears throat> moving to the epoch of ionization, where the first luminous sources uh, uh, started ionizing the predominantly neutral gas. And then from that point on, through the growth of structures, moving to the present day. So now one of the main questions that uh, we have in astrophysics is understanding how galaxies uh, went from the simply uh, simple first sources to <clears throat> the galaxies showing this uh, variety in uh, uh, colors, uh, shapes, and morphology. So that's the focus of galaxy evolution, studying galaxy evolution. <clears throat> to understand that, we need to link two very different scales, first the large scales, and understand the link between galaxies and the dark matter, since the dark matter is the main driver of the uh, evolution of the, gro of the growth of the structures, but also the galaxy scale itself, and um, <clears throat> understand how the properties of the different properties of the galaxies, uh, like the gas, the star, and the stars and the dust, how they evolve and how they interact with themselves at different, uh, uh, at different redshifts. Uh, how do we trace, how can we trace different properties of the, of the galaxies, starting with the gas? Here you can see a simplistic uh, representation of the distribution of gas around the stars. So here we have the newly, newly born stars, and we see the first layer is the ionized gas that gets directly ionized by the UV radiation. And then we move to neutral gas, uh, starting from the atopic and progressively moving to molecular and even more dense, uh, dense gas. So if we want to trace these different phases of the, of the gas, we um, target different spectral lines. Here I show some examples of the main submillimeter uh, line tracers. For the molecular gas, the most popular one is the CO, since it's a molecule after hydrogen. For atomic gas, um, <clears throat> uh, atomic carbon is a very uh, famous tracer, while the ionized uh, carbon is a versatile tracer that can uh, give us information about both the ionized gas, but also the, the neutral one. Uh, about the stars and particularly the star formation rate, which is the, the rate at which galaxies form stars, we can trace it uh, also through spectral lines, uh, such as H alpha, that is the uh, emission that we get from uh, ionized gas directly ionized by the stars, or the, the C2 line, the ionized uh, carbon line again, or through the continuum emission, uh, which at UV, we get the um, unobscured star formation rate, as it's called, because we see directly the light from the stars, or from the <clears throat> far infrared wavelengths, where we see the um, light has been, that has been absorbed by the dust and re-emitted in the far infrared wavelength that gives us the, uh, the, the obscured star formation rate. Uh, so using these tools to trace these main, uh, really important properties of the galaxies, uh, we can... Um, trace the, the global quantities. And when I say global, I mean the cumulative uh, quantity per moving volume. 
So here, for example, you see uh, the, the cumulative density of uh, uh, molecular gas as a function of redshift. And here, the star formation rate density as a function of redshift. And we can see that the resemblance of these two uh, curves, they both peak around redshift two, and then they drop at a sm at smaller and larger redshifts. And we see this uh, common behavior because of course the, the molecular gas is the, the fuel for star formation. And that's why we see this, uh, this connection. So this is first of all, a nice example of seeing why global studying the global uh, quantities of galaxies can give us information of how, what is happening, what's the interaction between these different, different properties. Uh, but we see that uh, at high redshifts, for example, here, the, the measurements are not very well um, constrained. Uh, and that's because the, um, the galaxy surveys that has offered us, have offered us these uh, measurements, they come with some limitations. Um, first of all, when, they, when it comes to high redshifts and uh, submillimeter uh, surveys, uh, they only uh, observe a small fraction of galaxies, and particularly they're biased towards the brightest ones, so we miss all the information of the faint uh, galaxies. But they also uh, they only cover um, a small part of the sky, something that uh, unfortunately doesn't give us the information of the large-scale structure distribution of the star formation rate which, as I mentioned earlier, it's also important to understand not just what is happening in the galaxy, but also how the galaxies are distributed in the large scales. Um, so as a complementary method to what the galaxy surveys can do to alleviate these limitations, we can focus on uh, mapping the cosmic infrared background. Um, the cosmic infrared background is the total emission of the dust in the galaxies across cosmic times. So we can, uh, <clears throat> so if we observe at a certain frequency, we get a map like this a 2D map like this, that practically uh, is the total emission of the dust along the line of sight. So this 2D map can uh, give us the um, underlying distribution of the, of the, of the underlying matter. Uh, the mean From the mean intensity of such map, we can uh, obtain the obscure star formation rate density. And reminding you, I say obscure because it's the emission of the dust. Um, but at the same time, from the fluctuations, we can get the anisotropy, we can get the distribution of the um, how the dusty galaxies are distributed on large scales. So we, we have two at one. Um, but this also comes with a limitation because the CIB comes from a wide range of redshifts. Uh, there are redshift degeneracies, meaning that we can say that a certain frequency uh, corresponds to only one uh, redshift. Here, for example, you can see uh, four different CIB maps uh, observed at different frequencies. And um, if you look closely, they, the structure, they look uh, slightly different. And that's because we have contributions from different redshifts. But again, it's not easy to say which redshift corresponds to what uh, frequency. And that's due to the um, uh, SED of the galaxies. As you see here, the peak, of the SED depends on the temperature of the galaxy, but at the same time, it also gets shifted depending on its uh, on its redshift. So if we observe at one frequency, we, we get all these SEDs from all these different redshifts. So we can say that ah, this frequency uh, corresponds only to this redshift. Uh, and that's why we can move to line intensity mapping that we can see as a 3D intensity mapping, uh, where we target only one line, not the continuum of each galaxy anymore, just one spectral line. and by
Sorry, can you talk? Let's see if they hear you from, from here. From there? Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I move them. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. About the, um, the telescopes that uh, line density map engagements, uh, we choose to put them in a single dish, on I mean, single dish telescopes. And that's because we, that's something that offers lower angular spectral resolution. And that's because we want to map the flat stations of the total emission and not we're not interested in uh, resolving individual galaxies. <clears throat> um, here I uh, show you a um, Comparison between uh, typical galaxy surveys and line density mapping, just to point out the main differences. One thing is, the, um, is the, here on the left. Yes. It's not saying that was all technical. Okay. Yeah, so here on the left is uh, what we get from a galaxy survey. Each uh, red point is a um, resolved galaxy. And all the gray points are galaxies that are too faint to be observed by, uh, by the telescope. <clears throat> but here on the right is the corresponding emission, the CO emission that we get from a line intensity mapping instrument. So we get the total emission of all the galaxies, bright, faint, everything. Does, when you say observe, observe mean what? I mean, uh, we want to get the CO for that. So, so the red one are CO detections, and the other one is what broadband detections in other gradients. The gray ones, yeah, they're not, uh, they're there, but they're not seen by the telescope because they're too faint. It's just a simulation. It's ah, this is a simulation. Yeah, yeah. You say that it's not the uh... just to show the difference of the two. Um, so yeah, here on the, the line intensity map, we have the total emission from all these sources that uh, you see. But this is a bit misleading here because another big difference is that typically uh, galaxy surveys they cover only this small area. While with line intensity mapping instruments, you get at once this big area. You can see here the scale. Uh, something again that we need because we want to, to study the large scale structures. So I'm not trying to say that one is the other better than the other. I'm just showing that they are complementary methods and they work for different things. Um, so Concerto, the instrument I work with in, uh, in Marseille, and I was built there, uh, is one of the pioneer instruments following this technique. Um, it was placed on the Apex telescope in Chile. It uh, observed for about two years, so now they have terabytes of data that they need to reduce. So the, um, the goal was to target the C2 line, and it covered um, 1.4 square degree of the cosmosphere. Um, it worked at this frequency range uh, because, yeah, you wanted to target the C2 line at a uh, range higher than five. The connection, the connection, yeah. We have the same connection. We do. You are doing wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Here we are online again. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the instrument that it targeted the C2 line at the register in five, uh, which is uh, the epoch of colonization and post epoch of colonization. But at the same time, uh, uh, capturing the CO9 at uh, around the cosmic moon uh, below edge of three. Um, so we don't have data, we're still waiting. Um, so the intensity map is a statistical measurement. Uh, so we need a statistical tool to obtain the information from it. And that's why we use the power spectrum, which practically tells us the, what's the correlation between uh, intensity fluctuations at different uh, scales. We can uh, model it with these three components. Uh, the two halo term is, uh, tells us the, what are the correlated anisotropies within different uh, dark matter halos. The one halo term shows the correlated anisotropies within a single halo. And then we have the short noise term, which is this flat component. 
which comes from the fact that the number of galaxies uh, that we have in a certain uh, area that we observe, uh, they create these random fluctuations. Uh, okay, so how can we uh, think, put everything in one picture and make science with uh, what I just showed? Uh, we have uh, the data, which in our case is the intensity map, either 2D or 3D, depending if it's uh, the continuum or the line. Um, we obtain, we compute the power spectrum from the map that contains all the physical information. And from the other side, we have, a, we need to have a statistical model where we put everything that we know about the galaxy evolution and the cosmology, we parameterize and we put it here. And then putting both in a solver, we obtain best two parameters that we are interested in depending on the, the model that we have. Um, <clears throat> we still don't have data for the line density mapping. For CID, we do have data. Uh, but in any case, before we deal with real data, we it's a common practice when we have simulations because we need to prepare our analysis tools and be prepared for any biases or whatever that will come after the real data. So that's why we, um, with um, my team in France, we developed this simulation uh, site, which stands for Simulated Infrared Dusty Extragalactic Sky. And as the name indicates, it was built in such a way that uh, replicates the infrared and submillimeter sky. And I will show you uh, an overview of how it works. <clears throat> so the starting point of the code is a dark matter halo catalog that we get from an embodied cosmological simulation. In uh, in this case, and all the results are, uh, I will show you, it was with, uh, using the Ushu cosmological simulation. And then we populate all these dark matter halos with uh, galaxies of a certain stellar mass using the abundance matching technique, which is uh, a simple assumption. We need to have a stellar mass function, which shows us the number of galaxies we have per stellar mass, and a halo mass function that tells us how many dark matter halos we have per halo mass. And then we assume that the most massive uh, galaxy, we expect it that lives within the most massive halo, the next most massive galaxy lives in the next most massive halo, and so on. So we do this correspondence and we build this relation between stellar masses and halo masses. We also assume a, a scatter because it's in reality it's not an exactly one to one relation. So we have from the dark matter catalog, we have all the halo masses, and through this relation, we assign one stellar mass to each one of them. Yeah, yes. yeah. Sorry to forget. Uh, there is no one to one correspond. Why the mass function of this of the stellar mass is not the same as the mass function of the halo mass? Uh, because there is not one. It's one not the same dividing shape. Yeah. Uh, why should it be the same? Exactly the same. I, mean, I, I don't know. I was just asking. Ah, no, this. Uh... But how do you how do you come up? You know, the stellar mass function you can get it from observations in principle of the shape, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a press circle formulation. But the dark matter uh, mass function is not a press circle. No, no, there are analytical mass functions, but this one is uh, what I get from the what I have the dark matter halo I, I simply count per beam. That's how I did this one, but there are analytical forms for this one. Okay. Hey, I will explain that. Okay, in real data, uh, do you take into account the incompleteness of this mass function because of the fact that in lower masses, maybe this mass function will not go like this, yes. but it will be lower because you cannot detect all the time. Yes. Normally, if I have to deal with data here, I'll deal with it, but now here everything is simulation. Uh, is there any way to include this in this effect? In the you don't have this problem because, again, the plant is nothing, you get everything. It's not a problem of incompleteness of the model. Uh, this galaxy is very small to be observed. Everything is included in the plant in the test map you get. That's the, what that's what we want to gain. <clears throat> Okay, so we have uh, generated the, the galaxies with their stellar masses, and then uh, we split into classes and we start forming galaxies because we uh, assume and it's been found that the classes won't, they don't really uh, contribute to the infrared uh, sky, so it's only start forming ones that we need. And we continue by uh, using several empirical relations to uh, generate uh, important information uh, properties for the galaxies. 
There's the star formation rate <laughs> using the observed evolution of the main sequence, and then uh, assigning uh, the continuum flux by first assigning an infrared luminosity using the Kennecott uh, relation, and then uh, an SD template to each other of the galaxies depending on their uh, infrared luminosity. So, on top of the continuum emission, we can also generate uh, line emission for each one of the galaxies. Uh, for now, um, the simulation offers the luminosity of three, uh, the main three main brightest uh, sub millimeter lines, uh, CO, the CO line, where we use first uh, the empirical relation between the first shear transition and the internal luminosity. And then for the rest of the transitions, we use some SLED templates. Uh, <clears throat> We also have the C2 line that uh, we use for that, uh, some also empirical relations that have been found between these two quantities. And also for the C1 line. Um, so here we have, uh, at this point of the code, we have as an output a huge catalog of all the galaxies with properties, continuum emission, line emission. And we can put them through a map maker or a cube maker to uh, pass them through a filter that the user wants. And we can simulate a 2D intensity map uh, like that, or a 3D cube like the line intensity maps that we uh, expect to get from uh, experiments. Um, of course, before we use a simulation and we trust it, we have to validate it. Uh, so for the recipes used for the lines, um, we compare the output of the simulation, uh, which is the everywhere you see the solid line is from the simulation. And on the left, we compared for the CO luminosity functions uh, to uh, observations from aspects, which are the orange uh, squares. And on the right, for the C2 line, uh, comparing with the points here that are the um, data from the Alpine survey. And in all the cases, the uh, agreement was, um, we considered it overall over, uh, quite good to trust the recipes that we put for the uh, lines. And then after that, something else that we was important to validate in our simulation was how well it can uh, simulate the way that galaxies are clustered on, lar on large scales, because again, that's the main goal of our study, one of the main uh, goals of our study. So to validate that, um, we compared the CIB power spectrum of the simulation, which is the blue line, blue solid line everywhere, to available data from Planck. And the agreement uh, in all the different uh, plant uh, frequencies, it was very good. The offset uh, was not better than 20, 20 percent. Uh, so that's that was very uh, important to, to have. Um, so uh, yeah, having such a simulation that we uh, we can trust. Uh, we could test some of the steps along the, in this big sheet I, I showed you. So first, focus on the statistical model that is widely used first for to interpret current CIB data, but also they're uh, widely used to uh, do forecasts for line test mapping experiments. Uh, but no one had actually tested if this model can give us uh, reliable parameters. Uh, so. These models, they are all embedded in the so-called halo model framework, <clears throat> which has these uh, assumptions that uh, dark matter uh, lies within collapsed and symmetric halos, that all the galaxies reside within dark matter halos, and that the clustering of the galaxies, the power spectrum part uh, of the galaxies, it's uh, modeled by the one and the halo term that I showed uh, earlier. And uh, the ingredients that you need to build a model like that is first a halo mass function that tells you how many halos you have the halo mass, a halo bias model that tells you how uh, biased uh, uh, the bias tracer is that are the halos um, for the underlying dark matter, uh, a halo density profile that tells you how the dark matter is distributed within a single halo. And finally, a halo occupation distribution, uh, which is a prescription to tell you how many galaxies and how luminous these galaxies should be that populate each uh, halo depending on its uh, halo mass. Uh, so for my investigation to uh, see how uh, these kind of models are uh, reliable, I uh, used the latest uh, HFD model that has been developed to interpret CIB data. So this model has a physically motivated uh, uh, star. It links the star formation. 
It links the star formation rate of the of the galaxy to the accretion, the baryonic accretion uh, on the dark matter halo of the galaxy. It's uh, this is the um, and again that's also I'm saying it again. But this in this way we make the link that we want between the galaxy and the host dark matter halo. Uh, <clears throat> this model uses this parameterization with these three 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 parameters. Eta max is the maximum efficiency that we can get, and it defines the maximum point here. Uh, M max is the halo mass that we uh, get the maximum efficiency, and sigma is the width of the, of the curve here that is also involved uh, with, uh, with redshift. So obtaining the star formation rate from this parameterization, it's put in the um, to build the differential emissivity, which is the emissivity of the halo per halo mass, and then using this. Um, the emissivity, we can build the one and two halo terms, so build the, the model for the power spectrum. <clears throat> the equations are quite big, but I just wanted to show it for, for reference. Mm, so, yeah, what's the test that I want to do here? We have a model that, uh, the model for the CIP power spectrum, and I also have a simulation that generates the luminosity of the galaxy in a slightly different way. So I wanted to see if the model is good enough to uh, define the right parameters I have in my simulation. So to do that, I uh, created mock data from my simulation uh, from the CIP map. Uh, I have the model I just uh, described with these three, three parameters. I fit the model to the mock data and I obtain a set of uh, best fit parameters. So I want these three. I would expect these three parameters to be close to what I have in the simulation. And I know what I have in the simulation, so I can do this test. And here is the result. So here we see it's the it's this curve, both from the model, from the best fit parameters, and the simulation. The red lines <clears throat> are the curves at different ranges that uh, are defined by the best fit parameters. And the, the blue curve is the average of what I have in the simulation. So comparing the blue line and the red one, the red ones, we can see specifically at lower uh, redshift, lower than two, that they don't agree very well. And just note that here we have a log scale, so this difference is important. Uh, so clearly the model is, uh, even though we can fit with the, um, the data, it doesn't mean that the parameters that we get, they are, uh, that they're telling us the truth. So uh, from this point on, I needed to understand what's the what's the problem. And the first thing that popped out was like, maybe it's the parameterization of the model. Maybe that's not the right way to, this parameterization here, maybe it's too simple to uh, uh, parameterize what is happening. <clears throat> so to test that, here on the, on the left, you see the original uh, simulation how it works. It's the one I, I already showed you. So I modified it accordingly, all these steps here, to match exactly what is happening in the model. So the first thing is, was to drop the passive galaxy because in the model we don't have that anywhere. Uh, and then change the recipe of, for the star formation rate. It's not the main sequence anymore that we use, but the exact parameterization the same as the, the model. <clears throat> and the last part I had to modify to bring the simulation exactly at the same level as the model was the SD templates that are used. Uh, in the original case, we have several templates for each redshift. But here for the simple uh, case, we use only one effective SED for one for each redshift. So now using this simplified version of the simulation, I generate again mock uh, uh, data and fit the model. But now this time, remember that the model and the simulation have the exact same parameterization. So I would expect for the best fit parameters to match exactly what is in the simulation. And here you see the result. Uh, so these are the uh, Three, three parameters, and tau is also in this one. Um, and here you see the fractional difference between the best fit uh, parameter value and the intrinsic one in the simulation. And you can see that we have an offset of even more than 30%. So it's not a parameterization of the model. There's something more fundamental into the HALO model framework. Uh, so the, the what is left to figure out is check these fundamental properties of the halo model, which is the halo of mass function that comes into the differential emissivity uh, equation, or the matter power spectrum and the halo bias model that go here in the two halo term. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is 
still an ongoing work because especially these two models for the bias and the multi far spectrum that it's not easy to treat them and uh, uh, you need to be careful to to all the changes consistently. Uh, for now, it looks like the halo mass function is not the problem, but there's probably something that theoretically we need to update these models here. Um, so that was about the model. Uh, not very good news. We need to update it. We need to make the changes. Uh, but going back to the data part, uh, I will show you some of the main challenges that we have, starting with the so-called filter field variance. So Concerto, for example, I told you that it will cover an area of the sky of 1.4 square degrees in the cosmosphere. What would be different if we observed a different part of the sky? So to answer to this question and quantify it, I uh, used the big simulation area that we have and cut it in smaller fields of uh, one square degree and computed the power spectrum for each one of the subfields. And here you see, how different the power spectrum depending on the field subfield that we use it looks like. So to quantify it a bit better, let's take the standard deviation divided by the mu. And so we plot it here, sigma over mu as a function of the survey uh, area survey that we have. So current the current generation of instruments, they are here around one square degree. So you can see that this effect is about 50%. So if you observe the point, you get the power spectrum, you will have huge error bars. Um, this is something kind of expected, but still, like you think one square degree, you think it's already big enough, but no, for this kind of experiments, we need to go even to bigger uh, surveys, um, sky coverage. Uh, so this one, at least we know how to solve it. But the next one is even trickier. It's about the foreground contamination. Uh, Concerto or any other line intensity mapping experiment wants to target one specific spectral line. Uh, so in this case, I show the example for the C2 line. Um, here in this plot, uh, bottom uh, left, you see the C2, uh, the green line, is the signal that we want to observe. So we have the amplitude of the power spectrum at a fixed scale as a function of frequency. Mm -hmm. But you see that, first of all, the continuum, how higher it is, so it's the main uh, foreground, but also uh, see the, um, the blue line, which is the CO emission that comes from a different direction. So the C2 emission comes from the epoch of ionization, but the CO comes from totally different, they coincide. So we need getting a map like that where we see both lines together, we really need to separate them. First, remove the, the continuum of course, and then separate the lines of interest. Uh, this was the work uh, of the whole PhD of the other uh, PhD student in our team uh, in Marseille. Uh, she tried a lot of things for the continuum, the spectral fitting uh, kind of worked. Um, for the line, she tried to mask uh, because we already have catalogs of galaxies. We know the, their CO emissions, so trying to mask these uh, CO uh, sources to uh, get only the C2 residual. It seemed to work up to redshift five barely, but then the higher you get, you need to mask even more, and then you miss a lot of information from your map. So it's not uh, it's not good enough for redshift higher than six. Uh, so I'm showing it here because it's, it's not my work. I just wanted to show because that's uh, something that uh, I'd like to do now here uh, at core, uh, developing maybe deep learning methods to. Uh, manage to get from uh, an input map like that to separate the two components, and that would be something very important for the, the community. Um, okay, so let's zoom out a bit again. Uh, I'll be, I was talking about uh, the CID uh, mapping and the line intensity mapping, and here you can see the areas that they, uh, the red range that they can uh, trace. And you can clearly see that they are uh, in trace sources that are foregrounds for CMB analysis. Uh, the CMB and isotropies, they have a, a lot of information, specifically the secondary isotropies, they tell us a lot about the post recombination info. Uh, if we focus particularly to the anisotropy called the Tsunagi exaltative effect, uh, which is simply the distortion of the CMB photons while they uh, travel through a, a cloud of energetic electrons. Um, this uh, effect has two components, the thermal uh, which effect, which is simply the uh, thermal exchange uh, 
the energy the, between the CND photons and the uh, electrons, and the kinematic uh, effect that is just the Doppler shift in the CND photons due to the bulk motion of the uh, electron cloud. Um, but this, the last one, the kinematic scenario um, of the effect is really important for studies to understand better what is happening, what happened during the epoch of ionization. But to get that, it's tricky. Here you see the power spectrum of uh, the CIB, the CMB. And if you want to get uh, to measure the kinematic scenario of the effect, you need to focus here. But here, unfortunately, you have a uh, very important background foregrounds versus the CIB, so the emission from the dust of the galaxies. You have the synchrotron emission from uh, radio galaxies, and of course, the thermal scenario of the Zeldovich effect. Um, so uh, there was uh, this paper in 2021 that they tried to model and use templates for all these foregrounds, uh, but also for the KZ and, and fit everything to SPT data, which are here the red points. And then they claimed the, doing that, they claimed the three sigma detection of the KZ power spectrum, uh, which is this light, uh, blue dashed light here. But are these the only foregrounds that we should consider? And unfortunately, the answer is no. And I will explain why. Here you see the two SPT bands at 150 gigahertz and 220 gigahertz. And at such broad filters, you expect that the continuum emission, this black line is the main important contributor. But we, uh, the galaxies that, uh, the dusty star forming galaxies, we expect them to emit in CO as well. So we wanted to see how significant would be the CO emission within this band. So to do that consistently, I generated CID maps with uh, using the R simulation, and then did the same for the uh, CO emission from the same exact sources, and plot the power spectra of the both of both from the, um, uh, together with the results from the previous paper. So here we see what we get for the CID power spectrum, and here for the CO, and the detection, the claim detection was is here this red line. So CO seems that it's indeed below, so it's okay that they didn't consider. Well, no, because the cross correlation of these two is this black line, and it's exactly at the same level as the as their detection. So the message here is that such an to do such an analysis, you need to uh, compute again everything, but this time you really need to take into account this, the extragalactic CO emission, something that they didn't before. And uh, doing that, I think uh, they're trying to include now everything in the likelihood and fit again the data. We still don't have the uh, answers, so I can't tell you how this detection will change if it go even lower or not. Uh, but for, for sure, the, we really need to take into account the, CO, the extragalactic CO uh, emission. Uh, Okay, very quickly, the summary. Uh, so about line density mapping, I hope I can teach you that it's a nice complementary method to uh, go to even deeper uh, redshifts and uh, uh, image uh, big areas of the sky at once. Uh, we have developed a simulation to test a lot of things about it. Uh, the models that are used right now, unfortunately the current uh, versions, they're not working very well. We need to update um, fundamental components of them. Um, the main challenges of uh, such analysis for line density mapping is the field of field bias that the current, uh, all the current uh, generation instruments are, will suffer more than 20%, more than 50%, let's say. Uh, and then another big challenge is the foreground removal and the line confusion. Um, and finally, uh, the last result I showed you how this uh, line density mapping or CID mapping can help to uh, improve analysis like uh, CND analysis like we want for KZ. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, how many questions? Uh, at some point, when you show the details in the model, you find one. You simulate and think and choose uh, what point you will start for the analysis. Right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, also, the simulations are based on uh, 
infrared intense chemicals, right? Okay, I was wondering, uh, did you account for the contribution of background basins and the intensity of the project with respect to the infrared? They will contribute. Why infrared is not mainly I don't think it's It's not that strong. I think they included in the uh, gases, uh, SCDs uh, that. Uh, Cheese, 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 cheese. No, it's just the dust. Only that, because it doesn't include the general group. No, no, because those further away, you don't need it for this specific range. Okay. Yeah, just to make sure I understand, when you were showing how you will, uh, how you will assign, you had. Uh, you have your flows out there, for example. You said uh, you use some recipes to go from uh, uh, LIR to spectral energy distribution and from LIR to intensity of the C class line, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you go, for example, you know, the LI LIR C class? It's not a unique correlation, right? Because we know that uh, it depends on the compactness of the galaxy and the presence of the LIR. I think it's a part Yeah, not a LIR. How did you get the C plus? So you had LIR. We already have this part here. Uh, so we need to, for this line, we don't need the LIR. It's the, the loose relation or Lagash relation. And uh, LIR is not a continuum, right? But and uh, you also mentioned that you had the uh, you go from uh, LIR to SED templates, yeah. Um, and that one there's also degeneracy, right? You have multiple SED templates that can give you the same LIR. Uh, LIR, the templates they are defined by Rachel. Because the, the mean uh, radiation width is U uh, parameter. But if you give an RHC, you don't have a unique LCD. Isn't this correct? Um, In the local universe, for example. Mm -hmm. You have a full sweep. The galaxy can be warm, cold, yeah. right? So it's a full sweep. And similarly, high RHCs. When you have the main sequence relation, for example, in the main sequence, you may have even the advanced templates, they have two SCDs, one for the for the starburst galaxies of the main sequence, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of like a simple SCD for uh, an average SCD for if you are on the main sequence. But the more luminous galaxies are often the ones above the main sequence. Mm -hmm. Right? So, there you also have a generous too. I which will affect your uh, C plus intensity. Because at each each redshift, it's taken into account that there are different temperatures. So we have different SEDs. But do you have different one SED per redshift? No, I don't no, 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 that's what I'm saying. For one redshift, you can have multiple SEDs. That's but how you select how do you ascribe in your model? So somehow you somehow you make a choice. Is it random? You will say, okay, I have X number of sources in my simulation, therefore moving volume at a given ratio. And a fraction of those I give this is the another fraction of the other is the yeah. It's not random. First of all, we have a we distinguish the main sequence and the starburst mm -hmm. according to some observed uh, probabilities. And then um, there is this uh, equation between temperature and redshift parameters. So if you have the redshift, it defines the mean radiation field, which is connected to the temperature of the. Where is it? And then the LIR probably normalizes the SED. It, it, this is published somewhere. Yeah. Can read yeah. the, 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 yeah. the 2017. Yeah. Okay, I'll read it. Thank you. One last question. No, no question from the audience here, so let's find someone. Thank you. This one for the technical messages.
not your food at all. Uh, so for you, the run works fine. This time, I don't mean it's. Uh, 